And if it doesn't work for them, they don't work with you. And that's really okay too, because you don't need the bad, we don't need bad business, we need good business. The only way to do that is to really be able to set the expectation and stand behind it with pride. Welcome to Pipelineology, the business to business podcast for agencies, consultants, coaches, and businesses looking to build a pipeline of hot prospects ready to buy their products and services. Never wonder where your next client is coming from. To learn more about our strategies, services, and for resources on building your sales pipeline, visit Pipelineology.com. Now, on to the show. Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I am excited. I am excited for this uh, for this topic. So, I guess for for our listeners at home who are not uh, familiar with what uh, what it is your background is and what you do, can you kind of fill everybody in a little bit about uh, a little bit about Todd? Yeah, a little little ten thousand foot view. Um, so, I've been in the digital space since late two thousand and six. Uh, prior to that, I've always built or rebuilt sales organizations the majority of my career. Um, I actually got into digital quite on accident. I was, uh, my, my current boss at a place I was working at came to me and said, listen, it uh, doesn't look good. You might want to start looking for a job. Um, I thought that was really nice of him considering I had a very young family and needed to feed them. So I did what everybody did. I hit the job boards and um, read somewhere that there's a certain type of ad you're not supposed to respond to, right? They're just, they're scams or whatever it might be. And I happened to come across one of those ads and, and flew by it. And about four or five job post readings later, I was like, you know what? I bet that's something really cool. And I went back and I applied and I ended up getting the job working on the interactive team for HGTV, which for those that don't know is a big television network here in the States. So that was awesome. My job, I worked on the entrepreneur fund. I was to monetize vapor. So anytime that there was a concept business that we wanted to do, my job was to go out directly to like American Express and Coca-Cola and those types of companies and see what kind of conversations or audiences we needed to build so that we could monetize the product. It was fun. Um, and then 2008 hit, the bottom fell out and they stuck me on the, the Blitz team and my job was to go around the country. They flew me around the country and I was a closer. And it was the sexiest damn sales job you could ever think of. I showed up on Monday. I ran 35 sales calls, 50 sales calls by Friday. I'd close anywhere between 100 to $250,000 in new contract business. And I'd fly home with a ton of money in my pocket and really great war stories. Um, I slowly from that position started to build out the first new business digital acquisition channel for major media, uh, traditionally print TV, uh, newspaper. Um, did $10 million my first year. We, we maintained the business and did 10 eight the second year. Uh, that turned into other opportunities, which were always on the, the digital kind of revenue side of the fence. Um, always had the little, the little devil on my one year telling me it was time to go out on my own. So uh, 2011 ish, I jumped, um, started with uh, doing agency typical stuff, right? Um, AdWords and uh, building websites and slowly realized that I hated building websites and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And um, went into really hardcore SEO. Um, actually got really good at it, fell in love with it. I was anti-paid uh, forever. And two years ago, stepped back into the, the paid space uh, because I got sick and tired of being the poor, starving SEO artist. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, I've been back in the money, which is great. Uh, the real money, you know. Um, so that that's kind of my background. It's always been uh, sales first. And my just found, stumbled into this passion for digital. And, and like anybody that finds something that just really gets them, I, I just ate it and breathed it and it was all I did. Um, and here we are all these years later, building up to being able to, to have the, the qualities and, and, and um, resume to speak to you. <laughs> well, that is, uh, that is awesome. I, uh, I can empathize with your SEO story. I, in the mid two thousands, that was, 
that was my, I guess, thing. I thought, oh, I'm an SEO guy. Yeah, this paid stuff is is for for amateurs. And no, no, I, uh, yeah, I, I I know the starving SEO guy thing. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? No, no, listen, yeah. I can do it. Yeah, we've heard it already. Good. Oh, great, here we go. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited uh, for the for the call. I think we are talking about how to how to pitch people properly so that you can actually get good good closing rates. Because I I'd say that's probably for for a lot of businesses is if they got get in front of enough people, just getting that closing rate up there can make a world of difference. Oh yeah, I mean that's the that's that's the difference between a starving SEO artist and a fat and happy paid ads guy, right? It's, uh, it's everything. I mean, we already know we love what we do. We might as well get paid to do it. Right on. So where, where, where should we start? Where, if I'm, if I'm trying to put together a pitch and say, all right, I have, I kind of have an offer. I know what we could do. Where, where do I start with actually crafting this pitch so that it's compelling? Yeah, so great question. I think to, to, to answer that, you first need to understand what the mission of a sales presentation is, right? I think that so many times um, we, we get lost that the sales pitch is to close the deal. And, and that's the ultimate goal, right? But really, a sales pitch is a bridge between a niche's pain and a company's pain relieving solution. And if you can marry a customer's issues or pain and give them a relief for that. Not only will you close the deals, but the sales pitch will also allow you to position the expectation on the front end so that when you get to actually fulfilling or delivering that pain relieving solution, you can manage the churn because you've set proper expectations on the front end of the, of the sales talk or, or the beginning of the relationship, right? Um, that's, that's really the big piece. So it's, it looks like this. It's, if you're going to make this a math equation, it's, it's the pitch equals niche pain plus the niche pain reliever or the solution plus setting the proper expectations through your sales presentation, which will give you the ability to manage your client churn rates and in turn position you to actually be able to scale your entire business. So in my opinion, the sales presentation outside of having an, a, a good deliverable. Like you have to actually be able to do what you're selling, right? So if you can't do SEO, stop selling it. <laughs> do us all a favor. But if you can actually deliver the product, the sales presentation is, is the foundation to the rest of the relationship that you're going to have with that client. So if you're on the back end of your, of your sale and you're losing clients at, a, at faster than you can replace them, and it's not a product issue, it's an expectation problem, which can all be managed, reverse engineered or optimized as we like to say in our space, all the way back to the beginning of that, that relationship, which is the sales presentation and reverse engineer further back into your ads or your messaging that gets them interested enough to speak with you to begin with, right? So the power that sits inside of that sales presentation is, is really, the positioning to to put your organization on the path to scale. So you had asked about how do you how do you start to create that, and I think that's really a, a fundamental question. Um, you know, when you're re, when you are creating your sales pitch, you need to be ready to pitch, and to optimize, and to pitch, and to optimize, and to pitch, and to optimize, and it's wash, rinse, and repeat. Um, and that happens probably for, I would say, prepare yourself to pitch that thing at least a hundred times. Um, before you can feel that you are uh, at the level of what we call in my group, Stella, right? So Stella got her groove back. You got to hit that level of Stella. And until you're there, um, it really does take a hundred pitches. I don't care if you're seasoned, you know, I've, I've closed more digital business than I can remember. And I can still tell you, it takes me a hundred pitches to really get just flowing, get my Stella going, right? To get into the groove that you need to know and own and understand to make this thing really work. But on the front end, we can stack the chips in our favor. And we do that through some research. So whatever niche it is that you're gonna be servicing, there's some really great things that you can do. The first would be dive into the niche. You may understand it at a surface level or a very well-educated outsider's perspective 
But unless you're diving into the questions and the challenges that these people face every day, you don't understand it enough to be able to speak the language to deliver the solution that's really going to make them feel like you are the Advil, right? To relieve whatever headache they've got going on. So I look at Facebook groups, industry specific. I like LinkedIn groups, industry specific. Um, I'm a big fan of forums. I like Quora. Uh, depending on the niche, that could be hit or miss at times, but usually there's some there's a nugget or two in there. Trade association websites are an absolute gold mine. Um, the f- the things that they write about in the trade association groups are amazing. If you look at any of their events that they have coming up and the people that are going to be speaking, what are the topics that they're speaking about? Because you don't go to a trade show and not deliver some sort of hard hitting speech or, or TED talk that's going to help resolve a major issue in the, in, in the industry. Uh, frequently asked questions on trade websites or, or other websites. Um, I like to read bad reviews. Uh, bad reviews are the best because a bad review means you've got somebody that's really pissed off, right? And, the, and what is that? That's pain. They're in pain. They're telling everybody how painful this can be. So you have these really great opportunities to do that. What you need to do as this is happening, as this process is is starting to evolve, is you need to start taking note of the things you're hearing over and over again, right? And you can pretty much categorize almost all the same complaints in every niche down to probably a handful of real things, right? So you get a spreadsheet, you pull it out, you put in your the things you're finding, and you really become a master of this. And then you just reverse engineer that. So look, we've got three major things here that are actual pain for these folks, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna look at the solution that I have and how does that back itself into resolving the pain? From there, I build out my presentation. Now presentations, as a standalone is a pretty vague statement. And I think people can get very lost in these giant sales decks that are all about me and all about numbers that nobody cares about. I don't care if there's a kabillion searches for one search term in all of the world, especially if I'm a regional company and only care about the Southeast. What's the Southeast? If you're going to do numbers or you're going to put things like that in there, make them specific to the person you're speaking to. So the numbers matter and they don't tune out. My sales presentations, I don't do any of that. I don't put numbers in, I don't do any of it. What I only thing I do is I craft the entire conversation around the solutions delivery to healing the pain. That's it. I might stuff in if I have them, a couple of testimonials or a little case study like things, if I have them, you don't need them. I do this through strategy though. So I'm not showing them any Facebook ads, I actually, very rarely ever talk about the the platform in which the solution comes from. I'm normally just talking about the end result. You need appointments, I can get you there. Here's how we do that. Look at how we lay out the the buyer's journey to get them to you. So when they're when they're there, they're ready. And that's exciting, right? People see this path that the journey that they take and they're like, wow, this is strategy. And for the first time ever I understand it. And I love this sales guy. This is my guy. And then you, you know, you start to bring them through the the story from there and then you deliver your value. Listen, here's what, what the program entails. These are the things you get campaign optimization, ad creative, multi-platform, whatever it is. Uh, You know, we talk a lot about multiple platforms all coming together into this pathing scenario. Uh, where people can start to see themselves utilizing Google and Facebook and TikTok and email and text messaging and all those pieces together in harmony to all come to one spot and then boom, the strategy blows up and they don't care about the platform anymore. So I can do whatever I need to, to make the result happen. So that answer your question? (laughs) (laughs) It does. That's a, that's a great start. So, all right. So if I've, I figured out, what the pain is yeah, and I can tie my solution to it. I know one thing you, you kind of mentioned earlier is we were, we're looking to make sure we pitch this a hundred times. So we get, we get our Stella on. Yeah. Um, what, what numbers should I be looking at in order to, to know, is it, does it, is it working? 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's two spots you need to look at numbers. The problem is the, not the problem. The challenge is one of the numbers you need to look at over the next 60 days. So here's how we do this. We look at the front end first off for closing rate. So you should see a, a rep should be able to fall on 20 to 30, 20% of the deals all day long. A really bad rep should fall on 10. Your good rep should be at 30. So anywhere between 10 and 30%, ideally 20 means that I've got my front end dialed in really good. So if my bad rep can do 20%, that means my good rep could potentially do a lot more than 30, right? So I look at that front end number first. Once my sales presentation can yield a 20 to 30% close rate, I know I've got my messaging dialed in. I'm hitting, I'm hitting it, right? I've got all the, I'm plucking all the sympathy cords and we're, we're, we're rubbing the shoulders where the knots are and the pain's starting to go away and they're seeing the light of day and it's really awesome. And then the second thing we, we have to look at is we've got to look at the back end over the 30 to 60 day time period to see, or 90 days to see what our churn rate is. So churn's incredibly important, right? And churn, if for anybody that doesn't know, it's the amount of people that leave quickly. So within the first month or within the first 90 days, they, they stop being your client. If your churn numbers, industry standards are really about 20% is an acceptable churn number. So you should expect out of 10 deals, tw- tw- two of them to churn out. And those are going to be for all kinds of reasons. It can be that, you know, they just didn't have the money to begin with. Uh, they couldn't actually close business like they said they could. They don't like you. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, or they're just what they can be at times, completely stupid and, and not not making good rational decisions or short-sighted. Can't do anything about that 20%. Everything over that 20% though is typically manageable. So I look to see if I'm at hovering at 80% churn and I've got a 20 to 30% close rate, I'm dialed in. So if my churn numbers are higher, if I'm churning more than 20%, I know that on the front end of my sales talk, I'm missing something. So the easiest way to figure that out, the fastest way to figure that out is to do exit interviews with your clients that are churning out. And when people are upset at you, they have no problems telling you the truth. Uh, Especially if you put that against somebody who says, oh, no, no, yeah, definitely call me in three weeks. I'll be ready. They're telling you, no, they're just afraid to do it. But man, once you make somebody mad, they will let it rip. And there's a lot of value in that, right? Because we can take that back to the front end sales talk and go, oh, this is the piece here where they're missing what I'm saying, or this is the piece where I need more clarity, or I better change this because what I did is I positioned myself to fail six weeks from now. You can't replace anything really that, that's churning quickly. There, you know, the bottom of the bucket doesn't have a hole. It, it, there's not a hole. There just isn't one. So it's just a fun, you know, I mean, you're just really dropping things into a tube. There's no catching it. So that's the, those are the two big pieces I look for. I look for the close rate as my first indicator that I'm doing well. I don't want false hope, so I won't scale yet. I will manage that back end piece for a month or three, depending on what my cycle looks like or, or when I think I'm getting good traction. And then once that's dialed in, now it's really simple, right? It's, it's how many appointments do I need on a monthly basis to get to the number that I'm looking for? And how many sales, how many calls can a salesperson handle on a daily basis in order to meet that volume? And then you can determine, okay, great, my ad spend or whatever it is, is going to be this much to yield these many appointments. I better ramp up because I'm missing three salespeople to make that happen. And now what you're doing is you're taking a very strategic approach to scaling and growing your agency. And it's really that, it's that simple. It's not more confusing it's, or it's not more involved or in depth than that. It's really setting and managing your expectations all the way from the beginning of your conversation through to deliverability. I find that that's really interesting to kind of hear you talk about using the, the presentation and the pitch to properly set those expectations. Because I think you get, especially in the world of sales, there's this thought process of you know, over, you know, we're going to, we're going to promise them whatever they want just to close the sale and get it done and move on. And I've, I worked in the car, car sales business and like, it's all the time. 
you see yeah. that. Just tell them, just tell them it's fine. Tell them it's fine. You know, shake, go shake their hand and, you know, tell them congratulations, even though you're, you're not even halfway to what they asked for. Yeah. Just go assume that you're, you're ready to go and you just get them, get them sold. So great statement. And here's what I found And this, that you, you'll find this true. I challenge anybody to test it. You have to draw your line in the sand and you have to defend your line. So if the answer is no, and you're afraid to tell them no, because you're afraid you're not going to get the deal. So you tell them, yes, you just moved your line in the sand, your expectations are off and they will churn out and they will tell everybody that you suck. Right? So customers want to know what the deal is. If the deal is no, you tell them no. And you know what they do? They go, okay. And if it doesn't work for them, they don't work with you. And that's really okay too, because you don't need the bad, we don't need bad business, we need good business. The only way to do that is to really be able to set the expectation and stand behind it with pride. And knowing that in the beginning, that's gonna feel like it's costing you deals and it isn't. Remember, it's a hundred pitches before we get our Stella. And in order to get into that groove, you've got to hit that 100 mark. Everything from zero to 100 doesn't matter. If you close a deal in there, fantastic. If you don't, no harm, no foul. You're optimizing your processes. This is the investment you're making in your business to get it to a point where you can put it to a position of scaling, right? So you always have to defend and just be brutally honest. Do you like that? No, I don't. No. Nope. Is it, can I do this? Nope, can't do it. That's not how the program works. Now I do have customizable solutions and we can talk about those, but that, that's a completely different thing and, and probably a lot more money than what we're discussing today. So you have this opportunity to still take that business if you're willing to, but you gotta remember if you're gonna scale, you have to have some consistency in your solution. So I can't do a custom solution for everybody because I can't scale at that point. It becomes too much to manage. Oh, I uh... Just I can I can hear you like I wish I was talking to you maybe like three years ago when when this version of my agency got started because I I know I made those same mistakes of I want to help everybody I oh yeah I could oh no you don't want to pay up front no that's fine that's fine we'll, we'll yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know just like, things yeah. things like now it's like go go away just kick rocks I'm, I'm done with you I don't I don't need that but then yeah. you you feel you feel desperate you feel like you need to say yes to people who will, are going to be terrible to work with, but yeah. you feel like you need to take it because you have got it in your head that, well, if I don't take this, I don't know where my next deal is coming from. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I put myself in a position of this isn't the deal for me. My next one's the next deal. So if you have enough volume of appointments coming through the door, saying, no, listen, if you've got one sales call a week, first of all, a hundred of those, that's going to take you what? two years to get through 100, 100 pitches. So there is a volume of appointments that you need to be getting as well to make all of this make sense. And we can talk about that in a minute, but that is the biggest piece is just standing your ground. And, you know, I love when people say, man, but I lost so much money in the market. Well, did you sell? No, well, you haven't lost anything. It's still sitting there. Well, I didn't get that, you know, I lost that deal. Oh, was it your deal already? Was it a current customer? No. Well, you didn't lose anything. There's no deal there, right? Sales is a numbers game. The only thing that we can control in selling other than our messaging is the activity that leads to deals. So I can't force you to be ready to write me a check today, right? I'm not actually, that's not really my job. I'm a hunter. My job is to find people that are ready for me today. So the hardest part of selling is getting the people who need what you do to know that you're the person that they need to do it with. And that comes from numbers, right? That's a volume play. You have to be pitching. You've got to be pitching five or six times every single day. Well, Monday through Friday, right? We have, we have to have some fun, but you've got to always be doing that. And the, and the numbers, the pure volume takes care of the neediness. You don't see a millionaire begging for pocket change on the corner because he doesn't need it. 
right? He's not going to take your scraps because he doesn't need the scraps. He's got enough volume behind him to not have to do that. Same kind of concept. If you put enough sit, enough activity behind your sales efforts, at some point, something's going to fall into favor for you. The only thing that optimizing your sales pitch is going to do is going to turn more of those opportunities into clients for you. But you can negate everything I've said and just do pure volume and you'll end up with deals just because of the sheer volume of it all. At some point, somebody somewhere is going to like you enough to say yes, <laughs> right? They'll, they'll feel sorry for you or, or something. And, you something. Know. You know, somebody yeah. will throw you a $20. I bet one of those guys gets a $20 bill every once in a while, right? So it's like <laughs> every once in a while, it rains properly above us. Well, very cool. So I guess if if that's all in place, then how, how do we fill the... How do we fill that front front end piece to make sure we're getting enough front or enough conversations? Yeah, so there's 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 a few ways to do it, right? We've got um, we've got cold outreach, we've got paid ad placements, we've got traditional old school cold calling, we've got well, that's about it. You either pay for it, you pay for it, or you pay for it. <laughs> one <laughs> one the other or the other. Um, it, it's really about, so for me, what we do is I've got, I've got a pretty small team. I've only got two sales guys. Um, we run, they run about a hundred sales calls a piece a month, 150 maybe. And it's a combination of two things. Um, it's a combination of paid ads and, uh, cold outreach, um, strategies. And then really just managing. So we try to get each guy to pitch at least five times a week or five times a day. Um, and we're, we're, we're pretty consistent with that. So they yield somewhere between 20 and, and, um, on a, on a bad month, we will see 20 on a good month, but we're closer to the mid thirties as far as onboarding new clients. So think about that for a second. You know, if every client's worth even $500 a month to you in reoccurring revenue, um, that's crazy money, right? I mean, was it's five grand for every 10. So if you're doing 30, you're talking about $15,000 reoccurring. It doesn't take long for that to turn into a hundred, $150,000 a month in reoccurring revenue. Now those numbers are greater as your product or solution gets better, or you get more um, kind of Stella behind you and you have more confidence. You can start asking for bigger numbers. Um, those numbers change and snowball quickly. So I think that, um, the faster you can get, now you got to remember too, is even when your pitch is dialed in and your churn numbers are good and you hire a new sales rep, you need to budget a hundred appointments for a hundred pitches for that sales rep to really get to their, their mark, to get to their own level of Stella, or sometimes we call it butter, right? Smooth like butter. So you've got, you've got a sales rep that comes in. If you book them 100 appointments for the month, 30% won't show on a good month, right? That'll probably be your cost average of, of, of no-shows. So you've got 70 appointments, which really means you're, you're like a month and a week before you can get to somebody to, to 100 calls. If you're making them cold call on top of everything else that you want them to do for you, those numbers are going to be substantially lower. You know, a good cold caller making 50 to 90 calls a day uh, you might see one or two, maybe three good conversations come out of that volume, uh, depending on contact rate and all the things that fall into those metrics. Uh, so let's say three, you might have one that'll take a pitch. So let's say that's five a week, that's 10, 20 a month, 30% will churn out and won't show to the appointment. So you're, now you're down to 14. So 14 pitches in a month or 14 into 100 is almost 10 months worth of work before you get somebody through their first 100 sales calls. And you're expecting numbers from these sales reps in 30, 60 days, 45 days, or you're going to cut them. We're not going to keep them. We're not going to keep burning money, right? This guy's a loser. He can't close, whatever. It's not the sales guy's fault. We haven't positioned them to be successful, right? And we haven't done that because we don't have enough appointment volume coming through. So as the story starts to evolve, right, we start with the sales pitch and the conversation and slowly it starts to see where the sales pitch is now affects churn or can positively affect churn and can position you to scale your agency. But on the same side or the other side of the coin is if you're not putting enough volume behind the sales pitch, the pitch alone won't stand on its own, right? If that was the case, I'd, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be on my gold yacht right now eating gold <laughs> nuggets because it would just, I mean, you know, the pitch is strong. 
but as a standalone, it doesn't do it. So you have to, if you're going to hire salespeople, you have to be willing to stand behind them and be able to scale them to take the appointment load so they can put the damn presentation to work. That's the big piece. So that's awesome. Do you happen to have any recommendations? And I know I talk to a lot of people who are probably in similar situations where, you know, they're, they're the owner. They, they talk to all the people, they take the calls yeah. and they're not ready or they don't have the, the back end scale to have a salesperson doing that, but maybe they they want to take 15 or 20 and that's really all their schedule really is going to allow them to do. Is there is there a kind of a solution there where, I mean, they'll, they probably, I mean, I know most owners that I talk to are going to close at the, the higher end or even higher than a typical presentation be, simply because they're the owner, it's their process. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a, a program that I put out, I've actually used for our organic piece. Um, it's a cold outreach strategy utilizing email, but it's not like anything anybody's seen. We actually are very low volume. Um, we only send out on a, on a busy week, I send out 150 emails per rep. So we see if uh, right now we're averaging about a 50, just under 54% open rate for that program. And we're yielding between five and eight, consistently five to eight sales calls a week coming off of that. Um, that's my favorite strategy. Obviously, I, it's uh, two reasons. I am the owner, so I did I did create that strategy, um, <laughs> but I also use it, and it works incredibly well. Um, I'm I'm very much in love with it. So uh, years ago, um, I took so the, the the kind of the process to get here is years ago. I looked at my sales team that I was forcing to do traditional classic pre-internet sales activities, door knock, cold call, and fighting this a, a massive amount of, of resistance because everybody hates to do that stuff. And I thought, geez, you know, there's got to be a way to automate this, like truly automate this and, and start to take the, 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 the stress of, of activity off of the rep and really make them do what we love, and that's just sell. So I started doing the master, I said, I'm gonna master cold outreach. That was my, that was my thing a couple of years back. And, and that's what I did, I set out to do it. And I did everything. I did everything you could, every guru and his grandmother was pitching online, did it all. Um, had a little bit of success. Actually was, would open my, my email in the morning with one eye closed because I was afraid of the, the threatening messages I was gonna get because <laughs> you knew they're gonna be there. And that just starts your day off wrong, right? Nobody likes to be told they're a loser or to F off or to die or whatever it is that you know we say to each other when we don't wanna read spam. So I started this approach, um, I don't know, maybe six months ago and have, have been using it ever since. Did a beta launch on the program uh, about a, two months ago and just put it up to go out um, to the street. So. It's uh, it's the best outreach strategy.com. How's that for a very pointed name? Um, I like that for, for a lot of reasons. One is it's very affordable. So you do use some third party softwares. They total up to be a, just under $300 a month. Uh, so it's very affordable and, and, and effective. The thing I'll tell you about that program though, is that it does take about four to six weeks to start getting appointments. But once they start, they consistently stay there. And it does require you to spend about 30 minutes a day doing some work inside of the, the process, but it's incredibly effective. And if your budget is tight, it's a really great way to, to have very personal conversations very quickly. Now we use that all the time, but that is organic. And as organic is, organic can be finicky, right? I mean, it can really depend on moods and all kinds of things. And whatever else is going on. So I say five to eight's a big swing um, a week. We also run paid campaigns and that is um, how we bridge the gap, right? So I'll get eight calls a week from my from my cold outreach pieces. I need to be able to close a gap of, of about four, 30, 32 appointments. And I do that through paid. Um, but there's so many ways to do it. And if you're a solo guy, this, this, the best outreach strategy is probably one of the easiest ways to do this. It's very effective. It's, it's nice too, because when people aren't interested, they thank me for emailing them. When is the last time? And everybody does, not just one guy. Everybody <laughs> thinks, oh, Todd, thanks so much, but I'm not ready right now. Or, oh my God, I, I meant to get back to you. You did? Cool. <laughs> 
so you know it's it's that type of thing you still end up feeling like a professional and and that you're more of value and you're not bottom feeding or, or crawling out of the gutter to try and sneak attack them for a deal right no that's that's awesome i know i know in my conversations with people that's usually their biggest resistance to any type of cold messaging on any platform is I don't, I don't want to get sworn at. I don't want to get, you know, essentially virtual, basically things virtually thrown at me. Right. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm begging for deals. So, you know, that whole, well, how do we, how do you position that? So that you know, people say, Hey, thanks. I appreciate you reaching out and it feels professional and still lets you kind of keep your, you know, self-esteem intact really. And that's a big piece, right? Because we want it. F- Listen, most of us left the corporate environment because we didn't like how it made us feel, right? You, you yeah. get your teeth kicked in by a job that doesn't appreciate you. You don't like that. So we, we, we kind of plow our own path and we're going to do our own thing. And, and part of that is not positioning ourselves to still feel like crap because of what we're doing. So I think it's a big piece that plays into it. It's effective, but it still is a feel good piece when it's done. And, and you're not upsetting people, which is the other part that you know, we don't have those intentions, right? I don't think anybody wakes up and goes, man, I wonder how many people I can upset today. If that is your goal, <laughs> then you, you know, good for you. You're probably really good at it. But for the most of us, that's, that's not what we're looking to do. So it's kind of nice to have something that, that plays to that as well. Well, that's awesome. Well, this is, this has been great. Uh, I think we're starting to run out of time here. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I, I haven't asked yet? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to leave you with a, no, I'm going to leave you with this little nugget. It'll only take a second. Um, hiring. So, you know, everybody's a closer today. Yeah. Okay. The deal is and the way that we do this, and this is my, this is my secret sauce to hiring sales reps that can perform is I've got a scaled down version of my presentation. I put it behind a locked page on my website. And if you want to work for me, I give you the login. You have to study that presentation. It maybe takes two and a half minutes to go through it. And then you're going to role play that with me for your interview. And if you nail it, you're hired. And if you don't, it's the end of the conversation. So the beauty to that is you start to see who's actually serious about wanting to work with you. Um, I love when I do that and a guy gets on and you could tell it's the first time he's ever seen the slides. You're like, okay, this isn't nerves. This is neglect. You're not my guy or you're not my girl. Uh, And then when you do get the ones on there that, that, you know, you can just tell they've been through it. They know what's coming next. They may not be butter, right? They're not smooth yet, but they know what's coming. That's how, you know, you've got somebody that that's worth putting into your organization. And it really does weed out the riffraff and the guys that think they're going to make this quick hit because they watched a Dan Locke video on YouTube, right? Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> see, see those. Well, um, I would love to take that guy on a one-month toe-to-toe sales contest and just see who could cold, close more cold deals. All right. Well, you heard it here first. Todd throwing down the gauntlet for Dan Locke. Let's go, Locke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. All right. So if anybody's interested in getting more info from you, you said uh, the sales, best, the best sales outreach.com? Uh, the best outreach strategy.com. The best outreach strategy.com. We will put that in the show notes. And Anything you can find else? me on Facebook too and, you know, ask. Um, yeah. Awesome. So stock stock Todd on Facebook, uh, check out his, his outreach strategy. We'll put the link in the show notes. Todd, thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was really cool. I really appreciate it. Great. It was fun. Well, and uh, yeah. if anybody does have questions, reach out because I don't, I don't know where I confuse or I don't. So well, that's awesome. I think we'll, we'll definitely have to get you on the show again in the future. I feel like we probably could have talked for another hour or two yet on, on some of this stuff. So it goes fast when, uh, yeah when you talk for a living, I guess. <laughs> thanks, All brother. Right. Appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Todd. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Pipelineology podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and look forward to seeing you on the next one. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay.